remember the um, one piece of, piece of enlightening advice you, advice you gave us when we were recording it um, Roundhead with Opshot the last album it was what was it stand tune stand time and don't fuck up yeah that's actually become a bit of a mantra yeah, yeah. 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 I love it and so that's your that's your mantra you, you say that to all bands pretty much yeah and, and because because musicians get younger and younger I can just repeat the same old crap for every generation of musicians <laughs> so you know it's like yeah I'm kind of waiting for I recently had a sort of um, you know a few you recorded my dad's band sort oh, of sessions Jesus. and so but I've swore that the moment someone says to me you're um you recorded my grandfather's band that's the day that I get the, the tartan blanket out and I'm sort of spend and watch day I just watch daytime soaps all day and <laughs> you're tired, yeah, you're tired. yeah so that's the time I had I had a really interesting one I was in London a couple of weeks ago and um I was at Dean Street Studios because I was at the band was like, find me an iconic London studio. I'm like, well, let's go to Dean Street because Tony Visconti used to own it. It used to be Good Earth and, and Bowie used to record there and sort of, you know, lots of amazing records have been done there. Yeah. And I walked out into the into the lounge. I heard this, Greg, Greg. And I looked over and I, I saw this guy I kind of vaguely recognised. He said, you probably don't recognise me. Um, you recorded my band in like 1996 and, you know, I was a young guy and we had a dad manager and it was like, and um, and I, I suddenly, suddenly clicked who he was. It was this guy, guy Ben Mark. Turns out he's now... He, he now writes all these big hit records for Take That, and he's got this room at Dean Street, oh, and geez. it's like um, it's like he's, just, he's got a lovely house in London, and he's like you know he's becoming a really successful songwriter, and this keeps happening. I keep running into people, um, so so my philosophy of, over the years of, of not being too much of a dick yeah. is kind of pay, starting to pay off because people don't hate you, right, right, right. <laughs> so you yeah. kind of like, and you get you get more work out of it, yeah. That and and, and get... actually, I, there's, there's an art, a young artist, New Zealand artist, I've been sort of co-managing. Um, for the last sort of six months or so, and uh, he, he he was in London. It was like, oh wow, I got you. Can you do some co-writing? So I hooked, got them together, and they did some writing together. And no. So yeah, so those the, the the my great age is starting to kind of feed into the useful connections now. So yeah, but yeah, that was so kind of, I've, I didn't know that you had that side of. So you've done management before, or is this the first time you? Oh, I did do management. Right. Back in the in the nineties, yeah, and hated every single second of it, right? Because it's a really thankless task. You yeah, sort of, yes. you sort of, if everything goes well, it's kind of should be seamless, and you shouldn't really know what the management are doing. Mm-hmm. If it all goes wrong, like you know, like if you get get thrown out of a country for not having a work permit, <laughs> <laughs> um, as which you know all about, then <laughs> then you know it's all gone wrong. So um, yes. yeah, I, I think that. Um, so I never really liked the thankless task, and I enjoy the creative side of being in the studio with people. But but sometimes it's just, and I think I think now I'm a sort of three year anniversary tax paying Kiwi resident. That desire to become a, a multitasker is starting to sort of like get into my blood a bit. Right. It's like why not do a million things? Like I haven't become yeah. a barista yet, but I'm sure that's somewhere <laughs> on, on the path. Are you saying this is part of the, the, the Kiwi? Thing is to diversify. Well, yeah, I just it's, yeah. well, you have to. The population base in New Zealand requires that you not only diversify, but also that jobs jobs are really transferable. Yeah. So it's like, oh, I'll, be, I'll work in media one day, and I will do. Some, I'll run a restaurant the next day, and I will do this. <laughs> I'll do a podcast, and I'll do some gigs. Yeah. So it's like maybe I'm just sort of buying into all that, and it's and then I decide, uh, well, actually, you know, I've got a bit of a knowledge base in that area, so why not? It's just about it's about networking and connections, and yeah. Of which your yours are extensive, I well, would imagine. And I never really used them and it was like it was only after I got married to Jackie and she was she said, Have you seen you know, have you seen the size of your phone book? It's ridiculous. And this wasn't a euphemism or anything. <laughs> you know, I do actually have a really big phone book. It was like you know, and, and, and over the years you just get to know lots of people and, and, and it's like, yeah, I suppose it is pretty extensive and, and a lot of people who are just struggling musicians are now internationally successful songwriters or successful managers or you know successful artists and and um, you know well, I suppose I should because I've never really hit anybody up for contacts before mm-hmm. it was like well why not start doing that you know mm-hmm. and, and part of that the way one thing I did with that recently was I organised this song hubs songwriting event myself and Apra. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about that because yeah. I, I had a tangentially had something to do with that with my day job with um, Auckland Council of Arts and Culture. All right, well, thanks for the funding. I yeah, it. no, no problem at all. Um, Kay did send me a, a, a breakdown of what it is you guys were trying to do, and mm. I was like, you've got to, you do have to fund this. It sounds amazing. Greg is this amazing curator. I mean, that was your role, I think, wasn't it? Curator. Yeah. Well, I actually title. went to Apra with the way it started was. Um, I thought when I when I moved here uh, three years ago, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm quite, I, I kind of know how the industry works here. And the last thing I wanted to do was be the, the guy that arrives, okay, lads, I'm in the country now, where's all the work? You know, it's like, I, I, I thought that's not why I moved here. I moved here because I'd spent 30 years in recording studios and I wanted to just take some time out to do some other things. And I thought, well, one thing I really wanted to do was try and do some things that really benefit young musicians here. Because the industry is constantly changing. And it's really hard to stay up with everything. And mm-hmm. uh, and I want to just ha- be able to pass on that knowledge that I built up over that period of time and try and you know help out some young musicians. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the ideas I had was, well, I know some really successful songwriters. Why don't we bring some over and just do something? You know, the, song, the whole idea of songwriting camps has become like a worldwide phenomenon. Lots of studios do them. Mm-hmm. There's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a second f- um, way for studios to have income. Like, you know, Black Rock Studios in Santorini do a great one. They do about two or three a year. Um, so let, let's try something. So I, I I met up with a friend of mine, Amy Wodge, um, who she just won the Grammy for um, Song of the Year, the, yeah, for the Ed Sheeran song she wrote, mm-hmm. um, Thinking Out Loud. And uh, I've known Amy for 15 years. And, you know, I did her first record. And, you know, we just... You know, I've been sort of like helping her out with some artists she's been, she's been working with. And so we... Um, so I'm like, I've got this idea. Um, are you interested? She, I'd love to. You know, who wouldn't want to go to New Zealand? And um, so I thought, well, I've got Amy on board. Let me go and see some people. So I went to see APRA. And uh, actually, I went to see Brendan Smythe at NZN Air first. He said, go and speak to APRA. So I went to speak to APRA. And I had, Aunt Healy was, yes, let's do it. We've been trying to do something like this for a while because they've had this Song Hubs thing in, um, and it's been kind of like going in Australia for a while. Mm-hmm. And they want to do something like it, but with a sort of more New Zealand emphasis on it. Right. So um, so then I started. Then it, it turned out that, that Amy's career just went ballistic because that single became like, I think it's now had over a billion hits on, oh, on on Spotify and YouTube. And it's like, and it's been a worldwide hit. And just so now she's just like become this like really super in demand songwriter. Mm-hmm. Um. But because she was on board, it helped me get other people on board. So I went to a writer in called Sasha Scarbeck, who I'd worked with on another record a few years ago. Um, and, uh, so, and, 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 and through his contacts, I managed to contact a lot of American writers. Mm-hmm. So we, we ended up with a short list of like eight really great songwriters, all with great CVs, and which I found we kind of needed that many because trying to get three or four people available at the same time of the year is really yeah, difficult. Yeah, yeah. So we kind of pre-planned it so it was just after the Grammy so a lot of people were in LA. And um, yeah, so we ended up with Sasha and um, and, and Mazela, um, who she co-wrote like nine songs in the last um, Madonna record. She did the, um, she did the uh, broke, met Wrecking Ball for Miley Cyrus oh. and written songs for like One Direction. So. Are these collaborations or actually they wrote the songs and gave them over to them? Um, some of them were sort of like songs they'd written outside that were then picked up. But um, right. the, the Madonna one was, she used to be signed to Madonna's label and she had to Maverick. To Maverick, oh yeah. And um, that's her connection with Madonna. Oh. And Lindy Robbins, who's like a veteran, not the word I like to use, but she, you know, she's been around in the LA sort of top line scene for a long time. She's written a lot of the hits for Jason Derulo. And so they, we had, and, and Sasha's, you know, he produced Adele and Lana Del Rey. And so, mm-hmm. so on paper, it was like, even I was impressed. It was like, well, we've done really well to get some really great people here. Yeah. So, and so Apple were brilliant. They came on board and, and they, they wanted to make it a really special event. So the writers would go back after they'd done it and say, you've got to go to this thing in New Zealand. It's going to be incredible. It's incredible. We had a brilliant time. And that's kind of what happened. Now we're getting songwriters from all over the world contacting us saying, when c- oh, can I fantastic. get involved? Yeah. So we've already sort of, um, you know, we're already discussing the next one. And I'd like it to be, because of the benefit to the to the musicians yeah. and, and the writers, it's been um, you know I wanted I want to look back and I want to do you know five years of it and then look and see how much difference it's made you know it's, sure. it's getting yeah. young musicians to think globally because yeah. you know you know you all know the pro- the pitfalls of being in New Zealand you know it's it's a long way from anywhere, but you know the industry's changed so much in the fact that you know young musicians tend to think more globally now they tend to travel a lot more right the mm-hmm. demographic of musicians tends to be slightly more affluent now you know mm-hmm. sort of like you know the, you know um middle class is a kind of is, is, is a bit of a derogatory term but you know what i mean they, they, their parents are slightly more you know have, have slightly more um funds available for them to travel and, yep. you know and and they live online so they sort of they, they think in a more global way and i found it was really interesting you know curating it and finding because we had a 
it was invite only, but then from the 50 people who were invited, we could only pick 12, and two of those had to be Australian because Australia put in some money in. Mm-hmm. And then to pick, to pick 10 was difficult. 10 New Zealand artists was really hard. So I tried to find artists who who were on a, had a career trajectory and a support network behind them so we right. could try and get a certain amount of songs released. Sure. So this week is the first release from Song Hubs, which is a single that, that uh, the Marla single, which he co-wrote with Sam De Jong, um, Mel Parsons, and um, and Mazela. And those first. collaborations came out of the four days. Yeah. So we had twenty didn't... songs were written, twenty one songs were written over the four days. Wow. The fifth day was um, was mentoring sessions. Yeah. So all the so the the, art, the artists who hadn't worked with particular writers got a chance to sit down with them for an hour and have a mentoring session with them. Right. Um, but I turned round head into five recording studios, so I had, I had, <laughs> yeah, how did you do that? I had like, well, basically, you know, because it was it was a very pop based thing. Kitchen. I, 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 yeah. I the, the difference that I wanted from the Australian version was I wanted to hand pick producers to bring in, so uh-huh. all the demos would sound really great and and could be the basis of masters rather than just be you know plonk out some piano songwriter demos. Sure. I wanted yeah. them to be so when you did a playback, it was like wow, that sounds like a record. You're almost there. You're halfway yeah. there or something. Uh-huh. So um, so I can so studio the control room of Studio A was one studio, the, the live room was another studio. Same downstairs, and then the lounge downstairs was Studio Five, which oh, is yeah. kind of like the knockabout studio for whoever wasn't working that day. It's gotcha. like rather than sit around or go to the pub, yeah get in and write some more songs and we kind of and then I, I just kind of went between the studios and I mean it was, it's beautifully done I was around as a lovely environment and APRA were great with you know they put, they put laid on catering and you know, it was a, it was a really great experience for the musicians and we had a, a lot of great songs written and yeah I'm 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 really happy the way it went it, it went better than I thought it would yeah mainly because of the caliber of people we were bringing over course and um but also some of the outcomes you seem you're starting to get to i heard there was some um uh, one of the american artists picked up on 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 a kid's song and went actually that's probably not best for you let's put it to this one here and now they may have a record deal. well that's happened and, and and well louis baker's in um who's one of the one of the the song hubs participants he's in la this week writing lindy robbins one of the writers so kind of taking her under his and her wing and he's over there sort of doing writing for the next couple of weeks um, Kieran McMeekin, who's the young artist that I manage, who was on Song Hubs, he just spent five weeks in Europe on a songwriting trip. Right. I basically was his um, travel agent. It's like this morning you're getting on a flight to a track and you're going to go and write some songs with this person. I did lots of times with publishers and um, and it's been fun. I mean, it's like yeah, it, I you're much changing as, people's lives, man. Well, much as I, well, I don't know. I mean, it's like it's doing what I want to do. I mean, what yeah. I'd really love to do now is maybe bring some producers over some sort of really great producers to do some seminars for young sort of, on the tech you know, young sort of producers and engineers right and, but so would you would you uh, are you doing more song hubs and then making them like specific to a certain so possibly, one song writing one producing uh, one well, the, the producing will be whiskey. separate from song hubs you know I, I, right. I'm, I'm still kind of like mapping that out because you know it's been so I'm still trying to maintain a career as a producer as well so I have to go back to Europe every sort of three or four months and do some work and you know it's um I, although i'm working with some artists here um you know i still get lost with a lot of clients in europe and i and i need to sort of go back and earn some money there occasionally and you know i can earn a bit more money being over there than i can yes but but what that does is affords me the time to to come here and do things like song hubs yep you know and because it was quite it you know it was a good six months worth worth of work and mm-hmm. you know the guys at apple were brilliant you know victoria kelly and, and aunt healy and those guys they were fantastic but you know the curation was quite a big process and and um and just you know just i just wanted it to be done really well mm-hmm. so it felt like a world-class event rather than just something we kind of threw together Right. So I wanted to have that reputation, like maybe the Black Rock songwriter camp has got, where people really want to be there and they want to go there and participate. It'd be really great to have um, a. I'm not sure. Then maybe there is one. The the business side of things, you know, um, it's all well and good writing songs and and producing, but having artists up to speed with the business side of the well, music we can did that as well because um, Becca Tishka, who is Mazela and Lindy Robinson, manager, so, she came yeah. over basically. The, Usually, the answer when uh, uh, that when you said to people, "Do you want to come to New Zealand?" Ninety nine times out of hundred, the answer is yes because uh-huh. it's a it's a destination that people want to travel to. Yeah. So when I was negotiating with with um, with with Becca uh, for you know Lindy and 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 Mazela, she was like, "I really love to come over." I said, "Well, if you if you and Mazela can fly premium economy rather than first class, I can make <laughs> it happen." And and to be fair to them, they said, "Yes, let's do it." 
Yeah. So this, so Becca came over. She did mentoring with lots of the managers here. We did okay. we did some evening master classes over at Apra. Because yeah. um, Becca has a, a music consultation website, doesn't she? And she well she and she runs um, uh, a big management company in in LA. And right. they've got they've got producers and managers, and she's she, and she worked in Nashville for a long time. She's amazingly industry savvy with a great set of connections, and and so she she was brilliant to, to have over. And I'd like to try and do that again to have some because the business side is hugely important. Yeah, and we did discuss this quite a lot um, over the course of the week with the with the artists as well. Do you ever have um do you have a podcast attached to that, like people coming along and talking to your artists and your well, that's something and... we can maybe arrange for the next All right. one. Yeah, yes. yeah. Oh, you you're reading I mean, my mind. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of things that you know. I sat with Anne here the other day, and we went through sort of what worked, what didn't work, and it's like you know, for a first one, we did great, but there are always ways you can improve on it. Sure. I'd like to yeah. I'd like to expand the curation process a bit more. It's mm-hmm. a lot of responsibility for one person, right? You know, and. and you know, you want to try and accommodate all the management companies and all the record labels, but it's just not humanly possible. So I, I think next time I'd like to certainly branch out a little bit with that and, and get a bit more input on, on it. But, you know, so far the, the results are great. And I, and I think by the end of the year, we should have quite a few songs that were written there released or artists that were on it using the... you. I'd say that the songwriting was 50% of it. The networking was the other 50%. Because yeah. mm-hmm. there's lots of little networks within... Like a lot of the New Zealand artists and starting to write with each other who met there. Right. And um, they, they, a couple of really good sort of trans-Tasman connections as well, uh-huh. um, which I think is important to build up. You know, cause it's... Um, they're our nearest neighbour, and I think if we can get some songwriting happening across the Tasman, it's so it's, it's a lot easier than having to go to LA or the UK to to, to write. So yeah. you're you're Auckland based, and you just mentioned before about how you go back to Europe. How many times do you go back a year? Oh, to, three or four times. Three or four times. Yeah. And you've just got back recently in the last few days. Uh, well, about yeah, about two weeks ago. Two weeks back. ago. And and what were you, who were you working with over there? Um, and where were you? There were about five different projects. Um, usually, when I go over. There's, there are things that need to do and people contact me can we do some recording I'm like well a lot of people don't even know I live here they're like I, I said well when, I, when, I, when I'm back like, well where are you I said well I'm in, I'm in Auckland New Zealand and they're, and they're like really it's, <laughs> they get really shocked that I'm sort of like why would I live here and then go back to, and it's, so, so what I have to do is try, is try to kind of bunch lots of jobs together right. which does make it quite strenuous kind of like um, yeah, um, you know it's a lot of work to do in a short period of time mm-hmm. so um so you just try and base it around one, one artist who often, you know, one label with the bulk of the work for who then pay for the flight as well, and then and then I tack a lot of the sessions, other sessions onto it to make it make it viable, mm-hmm. and um, so the last trip was I, they, oh, there's, there's been a, I've had this really strange connection with a band and a label from the Czech Republic for the last four years. Mm-hmm. Um, it came from my management in London, from Stephen, from Stephen Budd. And um, I ended up getting asked to go and um, I said, can you come and see this band play? Come, come over to Prague and see this band play. So great, I've never been to Prague, be wonderful. So there was me thinking I was going to some sweaty little gig in Prague. I went along and they were playing to 18,000 people <laughs> at the O2 in Prague. Wow. For their 20th wow. anniversary. They'd been together 20 years. And, then, and I, I sat there and I watched like, 18,000 people singing along with all these songs in Czech. I'm like, oh, yeah, so you guys are actually quite popular, you know? <laughs> so, but bizarrely, what had happened is, you know, part of the history was that the, the drummer had been killed in an accident a few years before, and, and I think he was a big part of the songwriting of the band. And their previous album had done particularly well. They were kind of like, they were playing these venues on their kind of greatest hits, really. Mm-hmm. So the the brief from the label was, you know, what can we do to kind of make this band popular again? So I applied the Rick Rubin theory that bands don't often know what they're really good at. <laughs> it's like it's like you know when you go into you know when you did the Black Sabbath record, it's like you're making records that no one wants to hear. You know, you would make a record that people. How did he used to make records back? You know, how did he make Master of Reality or Black Sabbath or you know yeah. Sabbath Bloody Sabbath? And they said, oh, we used to go in a room and we used to play together live. And said, so, well, this is how you're going to make the new record. Right. So I try to, you know, not that I'm any 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 Rick Rubin, but I thought, well, if I can tr- apply the same philosophy to to to, to Chinaski, who, who were the band, um, maybe that would work. So the first track we did was a sort of, um, it was a, 
they had this great brass section that had kind of stopped using them. So I just want to get some brass going again. You know, let's get let's and make this intro of this song just this massive like massive intro. It's like it's almost like okay, we're back. You know, this is we we're, we're back doing what we do well. This is and, yeah. and it was great and the, and the single did great. But we also recorded a, a a second song on the same session that was often that thing where you do oh we've got this other song can we just do it while you're here. So we kind of did this other song, and it ended up being like number one for seventeen weeks. Oh, wow! Uh, 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 and, um, <laughs> and 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 it was the first song I'd done that had, I think I think it's now up to nine or ten million YouTube hits or something. Jeez. In fact, in fact, the singles we've done with them, they weigh it's well over thirty million YouTube hits now, just on the singles we've done. Wow! And the albums. Well, then we so we did these two tracks, and um, so it was like, well, will you do an album? And um, and I, I said, well, where have you recorded your albums? And they said, well, we've always recorded in the Czech Republic, usually at Sono Studios, which is a great studio outside Prague. And um, I said, well, let's go somewhere really iconic. Let's go to Rockfield. And let's go to Rockfield in Wales and record. You know, I've always wanted to do a whole album there. I'd always done bits and pieces, but I always wanted to go there and do a whole record. And, um, you know, it's just one of the studios producers love to go because that Queen recorded Bohemian. In fact, Freddie Mercury wrote Bohemian Rhapsody in the stable block on a piano, on a piano in the stable surrounding yeah. bells of hay. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's and the Stone Roses recorded there and Coldplay did the first two albums. The first two Oasis albums were done there. You know, um, the Stone Roses burnt their hire car in the courtyard. You know, it's, it's one of those <laughs> legendary places run by this legendary guy called Kingsley Ward who's who still owns it. So it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a farmhouse and still is a working farm. So you wake up in the morning to the clippity-clop of horses coming across the, the courtyard. Oh, and, quaint. And it's amazing, and it's got a great vibe. And, and, and so we went there and we recorded their album there, which they ended up rec- recording Rockfield uh, uh, with permission of the studio. And it went straight to number one. It's gone triple platinum. It's like I went to see them play in Prague before Christmas. They did four, four shows to like 4,000 people a night at the, at the, at the Forum. They actually invited me up on stage as well, so I ended up playing one of the singles in front of all these people. You know, all these people. So I hadn't played a gig for ages. I had to learn it on the plane going over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I didn't want to kind of mess up in front of all those people. But because you're known as being a producer, obviously. But yeah, people but forget I actually do play drums. Right. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah, and you're and you're a total solid drummer too. Well, I have my moments. You know, it's, it's been. Oh, I've been playing drums for. I did work it out. I think this is my 40th year of being a drummer this year. Oh my yeah, God. it would be. Yeah, this year is my 40th year as a drummer. And was that your first thing? It's all like oh, it, everything else. I bluff my way through. Drums are the only thing I do well. Really. Right. You, you play keys on with bands and I play on, bits on, of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't go near a guitar because I'm the world's worst guitarist. But well, the but, first thing, the first um, entrance to music when you were a kid was that drums. Yeah, it was a school play. I was. I always used to, you know, I quite, I quite like the idea of being a bit of being a bit of a thespian, you know. <laughs> and but like the first, so I thought, oh, I'll, I'll put my hand up for the school play. So I did, and so I was there waiting to be cast as, you know, I don't know, I think it was Richard the Third or something. It was, in fact, it was Richard the Third. I thought, I don't know what I'm going to get. I'll probably be like, you know, fat kid who sits in, you know, sits with the pigs, <laughs> you know, or something like that. <laughs> but then, but then, um, but then this 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 guy came and said, um, I need, I, I'm. I'm doing percussion for the play. Does somebody want to join me to do it? And I'm like, oh, I'll just, I'll just put my hand up. And he said, great, okay, you'll do. Right, you can come and play. So I had to play snare drum. So he taught me how to play. Like, like every time the king would come in, I'd play, you know, you know this sort of thing. <laughs> how, how old are you at this point? I would have been been 15. Okay. Yeah, I mean 15. Yeah. And um, I'm like, and the, and the guy who who was the percussionist was um, a guy called Frub. I can't even remember what his real name was. Oh, right. No, I have no idea. Frub. I can't even really remember what his real name is. But he was a really good. He was in. He was a drummer in a band, the school band, and it was like you know you go and watch them play and they'd bash out some Led Zeppelin songs and a bit of Hawkwind and and it was like oh man it'd be you know I used to go and watch these gigs, school gigs and I'm like it'd be great to be on stage. There's way more room up there than there is down here in the audience. Like you know it's like it'd be great to do that and and um, like a year later. I managed to call my dad and just buy me a drum kit, like this little premier kit, mainly by tapping on the dinner table and annoying the shit out of him <laughs> until he's like, "Why don't you get full cotton? You know, why don't you get, why don't you get a premier drum kit?" And I'm like, "Well, you know, if you want to buy me one, Dad, it'd be, be, be awesome." Like, so I don't think we ever used the word awesome back in the seventies, <laughs> and um, so we did. And to be fair, and then, and I remember. How did Mum? I, I probably got. I'd have got a letter from Mum 
because you couldn't really speak on the phone and there was no other way of communication. So yeah, we didn't let, your drum kit will be arriving on Sunday. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait. It'd be amazing. On the Thursday, I broke my arm playing football. <laughs> oh, no. So my, so my first like month of playing drums, my my right, my right left arm's in a plaster cast. Yeah. Okay, and I, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I, I'd go in and I'd put on I had a double A side cassette, uh, Master of Reality and Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath. And I just put this on and I just like, you know, and I did try a bit of Dark Side of the Moon, but it was way too complicated for me. And that's, you know, it wasn't, if it wasn't in four, I had no idea what I was doing. Mm. Uh-huh. And um, also I didn't realize that the bass drum did something different to the snare. So I just literally can, and then put everything on the same beat. And, and the first gig I did, that's how I played drums. I had a ride cymbal and a hi-hat, and I put, apart from like, you know, the, the ride, everything else would be on like two and four, kick and... Right. And it was... You were playing a bit of reggae, or like a... Welsh, yeah, it was, Welsh but reggae. You know, I didn't know anything about... You know, and I played a gig with um, with uh, a lot, uh, my, one of my oldest friends, Andrew Raymond, who was, um, he was a guitarist. Uh, now, he's the, actually, he was the bass player and the singer. Why he was a singer, I don't know, because he, he's not much of a singer. But, <laughs> but you know, we did, we, did, we, did a bit, we did a bit of Hawkwind, the usual stuff, and Silver Machine, and, and we did How Many More Times by Led Zeppelin? Of which there is a, you know, they decided let's put a drum solo in the middle. Right. So I hacked my way through something <laughs> resembling a drum solo, <laughs> and um, and then the audience all applauded, and I'm like, and it, that was my kind of like eureka moment. It was like, you know what, I, I want to be a musician, and it was like from that moment on, I kind of knew exactly that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. You know, so then I had to tell the, tell all the sort of like the jobs board at school that I, I'd given up the idea of taking over my dad's engineering company and I was going to be a musician. And when I told them, you could almost see the bales of hay blowing <laughs> through the roof, <laughs> sort of like tumbleweed. tumbleweed and yeah. It's like, and, um, but you know, years later I get invited back to talk to them and, you know, how great a career in the music industry is and all that sort of stuff. What at, was the time, like- at the time it was quite a, and I remember I went to, I went to sixth form college in Hereford after I, after I left school in Brecon. Um, and and I remember doing a year of A-levels doing geology or something and I'm like and I was playing in a band at the time again with this this guy Andrew Raymond who I was in my first band with and he was in Cardiff University then so I would get on the on I'd go to go to college which involved me getting into Hereford getting the train to Cardiff and then going and doing gigs and no. very occasionally going and going and going and doing some school work right um, very occasionally <laughs> so at the end of that year I remember um my dad was working in the Middle East at the time, and uh, I came home and said to Mum, "I'm leaving school to join a band." Which, apart from "I'm leaving home to join the circus," <laughs> is, is the second worst thing a parent could hear. <laughs> so, um, so I did, and, and so you know, my allowance for what it was 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 taken away, and I go go and go and be a musician and be fair to them. You know, it's like you know they must have hated it, yeah, but they just like supported me and just. You know, just let me go and do be a musician, and and it was another ten years before I really earned any money at it. Mm. But it was like, um, it was, it was. So, how did you get money over those ten did years? Did I get money? Well, I used to do. I I did my dues. You know, I did the. I, at one point, I think I was in eleven or twelve bands. Wow. I just loved playing. I right. just like any if they were a band that needed a drummer, I was there, and it caused all kind of conflict between all the different bands. And I moved to Cardiff, which is which is the newest place that had music, because I was brought up in Mid Wales, and um, and so I just joined all the bands I could, you know, and 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 you know, and I also had a Simmons SDS five, so I was embracing electronics and stuff. So right. so like you know, I used to get a lot of gigs because you know everyone was sort of you know had fledging mullets and kind of shoulder pads, and we kind of like you know, I had a Simmons kit, so I was getting lots of jobs. Do, 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 do. Yeah, all that stuff. <laughs> And um, but I also used to do the working men's clubs. So, you know, every Wednesday we'd schlep down to Devon and play three hours of Whitney Houston and you yeah. know and Gloria Gaynor <laughs> and you know all this stuff and back the comedian and all that stuff. <laughs> and um, but it was fun. And I I I put my Sony Walkman on and listened to the Smiths and Peter Gabriel all the way down. And it was like you know it was a musical education because I had all this time. I would just sit there and just play these endless cassettes of this stuff and. And, um, and so you you were able to scrape together a living yeah, from just these all I, these gigs. Yeah, I, I, we be away all day on a Wednesday. Yeah, um, we'd leave at lunchtime. We get back at four a.m. Twenty pounds, so about forty bucks. Right. So each know, or yeah, right, yeah. Each, yeah. It was like it was a lot. Of, you know, it yeah, felt yeah. like a lot of money at the time. Uh-huh. You know, and then every weekend you'd go go up and play in the valleys, and you know, yeah. you, if you want to learn how to sort of 
deal with a hostile audience you know try setting your drum kit up during the bingo <laughs> you know it's uh, it's yeah it was pretty brutal so you, you avoided but having you, a fast food job or, or a retail job no, that's all right. I, but I, you know, I did have one job you know which is um, so basically when all this is so I did this for quite a few years you know the working men's clubs and everything and um, and then it's like I'm gonna need some money. I'm gonna actually gonna need to earn a bit of cash. So mm. I need to buy some new gear. I need to, so so I, I I went capping out to dad and said, you know, fancy give me a bit of a summer job kind of thing, which turned into kind of a winter job. And so 1988, um, I ended up on on Pontypridd Mountain, which is nowhere you want to be in January, you know, in massive thunderstorms, snow. Yeah. And, and his job was at the time was putting in ring mains for the collieries, the Welsh collieries. Um, so you basically had to sort of run, sort of you know, poles and cable across mountains between to connect to all the collieries. Oh. And I was, and, but I, I I get vertigo, so I can't go up the poles. So my beautiful job was in the bottom of a ten foot hole, picking out stones out of the mud with my bare hands, because <laughs> you can't put a pole in, in, in unless you've got level ground and you can't have stones, because then the poles will go, you know, off center and everything. I knew, I knew, ended up knowing quite a lot about putting it. There. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was, and I, you, you, we leave at six a.m. and we get back about six thirty p.m. after being outside all day in the pouring rain. And and at January eighty eight, I got home, and uh, the phone rang. And I'd been doing a few. I'd done, I I backtrack a bit. I'd done a couple of sessions at Air Studios in London um, in the previous year. I had a, a friend of mine, Matt Butler, who was um, I, my first ever drumming session was for his for him. I played drums on some of his folk folk songs, mm-hmm. um, and I did live in Canada for a bit in in the sort of early eighties. And the studio I was doing I was doing some sort of I was doing some session work and stuff at the time. Wanted another engineer. And I and and I was like, well, I won't be here because I'm going to go live in Canada. Get that young guy Matt in. Matt had ended up being house engineer at Air Studios in London. Then he was Paul McCartney's engineer. Wow, cool. So basically, I got him his first big break as an engineer, and he ended up he became, he became a very successful engineer. Um, did work work with Jagger, work with Paul McCartney, you know, wow, work okay. with Martin Opler, like lots of did lots of iconic records. Um, so Matt owed me a favour essentially <laughs> so Matt phoned up on this day and said um, do you want to come to Montserrat next week yes uh, you do I don't think I, I can't remember saying yes but I think I must have said it so quickly that I can't remember <laughs> saying it because it was like I couldn't I'm sorry, the thought right should I go to a Caribbean island and play drums or should I stand in the bottom of a muddy hole picking up stones <laughs> so I I um, so I said yes and he said great well it, um, it's, it's for a Canadian guy called Corey Hart, who'd, who had a couple of, he'd had a couple of big hits in the states, like yeah, that Chuck Sunglasses at Night and yep, yep. Um, Never Surrender. They were all big, massive hits in the states. And he said, yeah, Corey's been doing this album, and he's just fired his drummer, and we need someone to come over and play on the record. And obviously, I recommended you, but he'd also gone to the the house engineer Matt Howe and said. Um, can you um, can you recommend someone? And Matt had also recommended me because I just did a session with him in London, at right. London. So luckily, two guys had recommended the same person for the job. Mm-hmm. So basically, it ended up being a couple of weeks later. I'm sort of loading my Yamaha 9000 kit onto onto a, a plane and you know flew to Antigua. Then a Cessna light aircraft picked me and the drums up in Antigua, flew us over to Montserrat. And it felt like being in a Morris Minor in the sky. <laughs> and like the next day, I sort of set up in the studio and then and Corey turns up and it's just me and him. And so essentially what it turned out, it was an audition. And basically if I hadn't have impressed him, I was on the next flight home. Right. But mm-hmm. I didn't know this, you know. Right. So we, me and him, we just jammed for the day and played for some songs. And luckily I was still there a week and a half later. <laughs> and the rest of the band turned up and, you know, we were staying at George Martin's house and, We'd sort of, um, we'd, every morning we'd get up and we'd go s- swimming in the sea and, you know, then we'd go and do some playing in the morning and then me and Russ, the bass player, would go and windsurf all afternoon while they did guitar dubs every afternoon. Then you'd come back and there'd be a beautiful dinner laid out and there was a barman by the pool and you'd sort of, um, you know, another banana daiquiri, please, Des, and Des would come mm-hmm. down and give you, it was like <laughs> the contrast between pont de Mountain and yeah. Air Montserrat was, um, yeah, it was pretty monumental, really. <laughs> and, and that kind of like, you know, when you you get a taste for that kind of 
this is what I want to be a musician for. It's, you know, it wasn't the daiquiris. It was being in a studio, in an iconic studio where, you know, you've seen pictures of Stuart Copeland playing there on Police yeah. Wreckers and Jagger in there and uh-huh. Dire, Straits Dire Straits and all these yeah. guys. And it's like, you know, and um, and you'd be you'd be playing pool and all of a sudden Eddie Jobson would turn up and he'd like, you know, it was an amazing keyboard player and he'd like be playing pool with you and then Majur would turn up. They'd all be on holidays on the island and mm. right. you were in this environment of like this, all this they ever wanted to be was in this sort of environment and playing this sort of music. And, and um and then and then Corey was like, Well, do you want to come on tour with me? So I literally went you know, at the end of that year we went we went to Canada and rehearsed in Montreal and we went to Japan and we went to the Philippines and we did Canadian shows. And I remember the first Canadian show, because literally the gig before it was a, with the Poets Corner in Cardiff, and the next show was like an ice hockey arena in Canada. <laughs> We're on, a, on this massive drum riser with this huge light show. And uh and I remember playing the, the the set would start with just me and this big light show going on, and then Corey would come and all the girls would go screaming and crazy, and um, and we do this the intro to the track was just like a drum and vocal intro thing, and I reckon I played that first song on the first gig maybe three times the speed. <laughs> <laughs> I was so pumped up on adrenaline. It was like because it was like this is all I've ever wanted, you know, in yeah. all the you just it wasn't to belt out glory again as you know or, or you know belt I will survive at a gig in in car in 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 astrid manic or something it was yeah. to be on stage in like some ice hockey arena in canada, in canada. playing this stuff and yeah. it was um yeah so so that was when i was 27 so that was kind of like when it started sort of you know earning decent money as a musician right and luckily at that in in between Corey's album and at Mon, in montserrat and his tour i did an album for a welsh band called waterfront was a couple of guys I knew in in I'd known in Cardiff who signed this massive record deal with SBK Records, um, who were a really big label at the time. Um, Charles Copperman, who's still a massive industry player, was the K. He was the K in, in SBK, and um, turns out they had a they had a massive hit in the states with one of the songs off it. It was top ten hit in America. So I ended up coming off Corey's tour and then becoming MD for their tour. Right. So I kind of picked the musicians and, um, you know, we sort of, so I ended up going to tour in America with them. And, uh, and then when that tour finished, I started writing songs with, 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 with them. It eventually turned out into, into the, the singer's solo record. Um, and he was signed to EMI Publishing. So I went to EMI and said, do you want to sign my publishing? I said, yeah, great. We'll give you a publishing deal. So Just me, like me the world's worst <laughs> songwriter. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I've always yeah, admired great deal. songwriters <laughs> and I ain't one of them, you know, and, um, but I got a publishing deal which opened up a lot of doors industry wise. And, and, um, and one of those jobs was that the first, the first job after I signed with them was, um, a lot of lyrics arrived. It was, this was like early nineties. So they arrived by fax. I think I know what you're about to say, and this is where Danny wanted to get to with this. Right. <laughs> it was, um, a, and it was three sets of lyrics um, from 20th Century Fox for the for the Simpsons. Ah, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, um, so I, I phoned up um, EMI and said, "I've just got these lyrics through for for it's." They said, "Yeah, what it is is they the um, they didn't want an all American album. They wanted some overseas writers to work, have some, so you know, have a bit of a different flavor and everything." Um, pick a song. He said, "said you know, I should warn you that everyone's going to have a go at it because everyone wants to get a song on the record." Right. I'm like, okay, well, you know, what else have I got to do? I've got my advance in the bank, and I've got sort of, you know, I've got time. So why didn't I give it give it a go? And um, so I had this old kind of keyboard lick lying around because also in, in the intervening time between this and the um, and Chris's record, I, I started doing a bit of dance music in the downtime at the band studio because they'd bought like a 16 trap machine and everything and I got a record deal with Pete Tong doing dance music no shit yeah so I was kind of for my brief flirtation with dance music I had a TR909 I had like you know this before Pete Tong went he was global he he just got a show on Radio 1 and he um, he he was head of A&R FFRR, which is a quite big dance it was, part, it was the dance arm of London Records. Right. And someone managed to fluke this record deal with Pete. Uh-huh. And it was like, and we had a couple of singles out and didn't really do much, but it, but it was quite fun. It was quite, you know, it was, quite, it, was, it, was it was more of a transition for me getting to programming. And, you know, it was programming that those days was very different to what it was now. It was like my Casio s- sampler that had two meg of memory, yeah. you know, and things like that. And like my <laughs> hardware sequences and everything. And um, 
So I had this, I had this keyboard riff left over, left over. I realized, but we'd never get to work with the band. And it was like, oh, let's dig it out. So I found the floppy disk that it was on, <laughs> put it in. It's like, oh, it still sounds pretty good. So I started thing. And then I, I kind of heard for the grapevine that a lot of the writers, because they a lot of people to pick this track, The Ten Commandments of Bart, which is a song that, that Matt Groening had written the lyrics for. Because obviously there's a better chance that that was going to be on the record because Matt had written the lyrics. Right. Mm-hmm. I thought, well, I'm going to have a shot at it. But I, rather than just do a little bit of it like everyone's going to do, because it was there was 10 verse, 11 verses for starters. Oh, I'm like, I'm just going to do more. I'm going to do the whole thing. So I just spent a week on this track, you know, and I just, um, and I got a mate of mine who was, um, who was, who was in my dance project, you know, that uh, came in and came in wrapped on it, kind of harmonized his voice up to sound a bit like Bart and, and, um, and I, there's all kinds of stuff. My dog's on it, you know, because I basically, I basically, just, I, I did, I did the anti Simpsons things. So the, the policy of the Simpsons is always, um, score the emotion not the action mm-hmm. I just scored the action all the way through just, if there was a door slamming it was on the record <laughs> it was like so I just did this whole thing and, and, I, and I put this whole thing I thought that's, that's what it sounds alright and my ex-wife Marwenna she wrote the chorus for it because that's how I met her she was, um, she was a songwriter and she wrote a really great chorus for it and everything and um, yeah we just recorded it and uh, and didn't think anything of it sent it off to EMI and a couple of months later, um, another fax arrives. It was the original fax that EMI had sent to to Fox, saying, "You know, here's this track. What do you think?" And 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 the head of music at Fox had, had just written across it, "We like this. Send him over." Uh-huh. That was the only correspondence, you know. Right. Uh, and um, so we kind of figured out the best way to do it with my manager at the time, and because of like work permit restrictions and everything, I thought we thought what we'll do is we'll record all the music in in the UK send uh-huh. the tapes over then I'll go to the States as a tourist I shouldn't uh-huh. even be saying this should I because I'll never work in America <laughs> again and, um, and, and well, we'll allegedly and, you know, allegedly <laughs> and we'll we will record, record all the actors so I went to Mole Studio in Bath um, and essentially just used all the, the stuff that was on the demo including the dog so my dog is immortalised on the Simpsons record my dog Twinkle <laughs> at the time and um I got you know got some great singers in because of the, who I knew um, John Reed who's now a, he's like a you know he, I think he's written a lot of the big Kelly Clarkson hits and everything he's a massive songwriter now and uh, Mary Chiani who's a who's an artist who's still who, who lives in Australia now they all came in we did this big gospel thing for the choruses and and then then she, oh, and there was one little section that that basically there's like a hip hop verse or like you know nineties hip hop verse. And um, when Maggie joins in on her pacifier, um, and I'm like, they're like, uh, I got this urgent message from Fox. Um, you have to use the you know, Maggie's actual pacifier thing. You can't just, um, you know, you can't use any old sound right. effect. You know, yeah. We will send you it. And this FedEx package arrived when we we're in the studio. Yeah, you know, it's like you ripped it open. There's like a dat in it, and inside this dat, which I've still got, is just like the, the sound effect, of, which is Matt Green in the. <laughs> you know and it's like they, I don't know how much money they, um, they spent um, on sending this thing over and, anyway it was on the track and, and then just, just one or were there lots of different versions of, no, of the best fight it's, it's about five seconds of it right yeah, is it all yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, if I can dig it out for you I'll, I'll, I'll play it to you at some yeah. point uh, and because um, I kept a lot of the memorabilia from that session I thought one day you know my, my nieces and nephews are going to have yeah. something that they can sell yeah. you know exactly I got all kinds of little sort of things for Matt Groening and stuff and um, yeah, so we so we, we sent the stuff over to the states, and I remember, I, right? I put I put a budget in for the sessions, and um, and then I got a call from Fox. Uh, we had your budget. Um, is that all you need? Which to this day is the only time anyone's ever said that to me on an album budget or a record budget. It's like you know, is this all you need? I'm like, well, yeah. I got a car, and I got a hotel, and I got a flight. It's like, you know, you've booked the studio. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we'll upgrade everything. So first class travel, amazing right. hotel, some Camaro convertible sports car, oh, and it's like. Christ. So they're used to people adding zeros, obviously. Essentially, it was a film company, and I, and I suddenly <laughs> yeah. realized that the, the the difference between working for a film company and working a for a, a record company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to, and, and you know, it's like the only other time I've ever experienced that was when I worked for a games company. I did some stuff for Rockstar Games a few years ago and it's like seeing the difference in budgets between a rec company budget and a, a gamers company budget was almost even more extreme than a 
than a film company budget. Even these, yeah, especially these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was crazy. But that's another story. Mm. So, so, um, yeah, so I, I sort of arrived in the States and my first the session for the vocal session was at Capitol. Oh, no Capitol, shit. You know, the Capitol most Records. iconic building yeah, in yeah. Los Angeles. And I, I turn up there and um, sort of I'm sitting there kind of like on, got in there early on day one, super keen Welsh guy, you know. And this, this little blonde woman comes in and goes, uh, you know, hi, you know, pleased to meet you. And, she, and, uh, and I said, I didn't know who she was. And she, she said, yeah. And I said, oh, I said, oh, can I help you at all? You, you had to see Matt or something. She goes, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Nancy Cara. I'm, I'm Bart Simpson. <laughs> and, uh, oh, you know, pleased to meet you. And she, and she, she said, oh, and, and who are you? And to this day, I, I can't even believe what I said. I said, Oh, I'm nobody. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because I knew, because I knew down the road that like George Clinton was in a studio recording stuff, and like um, Linda Ronstadt was in another studio doing things, and it was all this crazy stuff. And like CNC Music Factory were doing another track on the record, and it was all this stuff going on in the, in the city at the time. All these different studios being used for this record, and I was just some kid from Cardiff who was just like sort of, I was just doing. You know, I call this song, see? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it was amazing. And, and then Matt Groening came in, who was just incredible. It turns out we were both massive Frank Zappa fans. And he's a, a world aficionado on Frank Zappa. Right. And we just essentially just talked about Frank Zappa for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And um, You made it sound also very easy. You know, oh, yeah, just get a publishing deal, yeah. um, <clears throat> get a, a song get a song on the Simpsons soundtrack, fly and make a career in L.A., it, it all seems to have come together very I've quickly. I've condensed all the good bits. Of course, yeah. There, there's, there's still 80% failure. But also, Maybe 90% failure. But were you, know? you ambitious? Um, we, we, you know, were you actually like going from plan to plan? And or I'd love to say yes. I had <laughs> master plan that I and I followed yeah. it through. But you know, we we all know the music industry is not like that. No, it was, it's essentially you you try and spot an in and you try and figure out a way to make it work. And I think it was just. You know, like when I got the publishing deal, it was like I saw an opportunity. It was like I was dealing every day with 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 the head of publishing at EMI. It was like, well, why don't I just ask her? Because what you're going to say, no, and I'm in no worse position than I would be before. True. So I said, you know, would you like to put me in publishing? And they said yes. And it was that. It, it was. I wasn't expecting her to say yes, but she said yes. So then everything kind of follows on from that. So you know, it's everything is is interconnected, and it's um. No, you try. You try it, I think it's just. I think the, what I always try to express if I'm talking to young musicians about how in a career in the industry is that flexibility is everything. Mm-hmm. You know, whether you're playing drums on a record, or you're producing a record, or you're engineering, or you're songwriting, or you know, you're set up, you're a session player. It's, it's like if you if you limit yourself, I am this sort of, I am this, you know, I am a session player, and that's all I do, mm-hmm. or I am, you know, I, I don't think with my bit, level of ability, I would have got through. I'd have given up years ago but right. by being super flexible mm. and that even goes down to how much money you get paid it's like well mm-hmm. how, these days it's almost like how much do I want to do the record how much aggro will it be and I basically charge on what the aggro level is going to be as opposed to you know if I really want to do a record and you figure out a way to do it you know yeah. if you love the music you want to do it I mean, luckily, I'm in that position now where I can do that. But you know, there's a lot of years where you're just like, I've got a mortgage to pay. I've got this to do. I've got, you know. So when did you, at what point did you switch over from, because it's a different discipline being a musician from being a musician and an engineer. I know that you you work the desk as well and um, and then on to producer. How did those things come about? Did you just fall into them or did you seriously sit down and train in it or? Well, there was no, like the engineering thing was, the weirdest one because there was no courses like there is now there was no SAE there was no mains there was nothing like that yeah so the engineering was kind of like I always thought the worst job in the world as a studio engineer you know mm-hmm. first in last out thankless task you kind of like people shouting at you all day you know it's like oh god I thank I thank goodness I'm not a recording engineer yeah. and then <laughs> and then um I kind of like figured out how to do it just by hitting buttons and you know and when and when I had my publishing deal I had bits of gear that I bought with, with some of the advance and EMI bought me bits of stuff and there was bits of stuff left over from the waterfront studio and so I had kind of a knowledge and then the studio down the road um, there was two studios in the same block in in, in well there's two rehearsal rooms I had, and I had a, 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 a studio in one of the rehearsal rooms where I did the Simpsons record and I was kind of I was getting divorced at the time so I was a little bit skint 
um because divorces are not cheap not cheap they're not known to be cheap yeah, yeah and um and then the the um studio manager at the time said um alec, alec silver who was who's now gone on to be a hugely successful producer in germany um is leaving because he'd slept he'd split up from his girlfriend and he'd moved to london he's moving to london and uh, right. and he's um do you want a job i'm like God, it'd be a bit extra cash, you know, it'd be kind of handy. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'd never mic'd up a drum kit before. Like, I'd been the drummer on sessions and I'd yeah. seen people do it. Right, yeah. I'm like, how hard can it be? So, you know, I go in the first day and... How hard <laughs> is it? Is it that hard? Well, I kind of m- muscled my way through. Right. But the thing is, difference between recording now and recording then, if you were working in a studio, you knew more than the musicians you were working with about the recording process, however little you knew. Right. It was almost a Quentin Crisp theory. He, he was a dance instructor, but he would be, all he would be was one lesson ahead of the students. Right. He'd right. go for a dance lesson, <laughs> yep. then he'd charge his students more to teach them what he'd learned from the dance teacher, so he was one step ahead. Right. So I had, I, had that appro- <laughs> I had that approach to engineering. That's brilliant. It was like, I know more than the people who are coming to the studio, because no one's gone, there's no recording courses, no one knows what they're doing. Yeah. I know that a little bit more than them, so I'll put some mics up and try and seem like, you know, the, the analogy I always use is um, the hunt for Red October. Which uh-huh. is like when the Pretty ship's sure. um, some one of the crew comes up to the ship's captain and says, um, "You know, captain, what do we do?" And the, and and I think it's Sean Connery's the c- captain. Mm. Yeah, says I don't know. And then the ship's mate pulls him aside and says, "You never, you say never that. say that. You've yeah. always got to, you know, at least pretend you know what you're talking about." Right. Yeah. So I'm like, I've I've, I've always applied that same technique to <laughs> to recording. It's like, just say you know what you're doing, even if yeah. you don't know. Yeah. I'm going to clue what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of got through it. I remember on the first Hang day. Hang on, was that Hunt for the Red October or Crimson Tide? But Cr- Crimson I feel Tide. like it was it's, Denzel it's, it's Washington. one of those kind of films. films. Yeah. yeah. Right. But it was, you know, the, the, you know, the salty old sea dog says to him, yeah. you know, right. you got to... Never say it, yeah. So, so, so I thought, well, that's a pretty good bit of advice, you know, and, and I will take that on board. And, you know, I remember on that first session thinking, the guitar sounds a bit weird. It's like, it feels a bit, doesn't feel very present, but... You know, it's where it's going to tape. I can see the level. It's fine. Turned out like the vocal mic was like six feet away, and I had the wrong mic plugged in, and the guitar sound is essentially <laughs> what was bleeding at the vocal mic. And but right. no, and no, to this day, the band don't know that was the case. You know, right. it was just the it was they the, vi- now, it was the vibe listening. I went for. <laughs> and 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 then yeah, yeah, that was that was my plan. I wanted more presence. Oh, yeah, I, I wanted know, more room in I there. I want that sort of yeah, that distant <laughs> mic from six feet away vibe. <laughs> and. Um, but you know, th- there was another example, like a few years later, when um, the BBC, God bless them, they, they, they they've, they, you know, they do this, this, this their radio sessions, the John Peel sessions, you know, legendary and all the, the Medavale stuff. But also, all the regions do um, radio sessions as well. I used to do radio sessions, and the BBC phoned up one day and said, um, "You know how to work an SSL, don't you?" And I'm like, "Yes, yes, I do." <laughs> <laughs> not ever ever touched one in anger in my life like so oh can you record a band um this thursday um 11 o'clock start you know and tell me what the rates were so it's a bit of money oh excellent my taxpayer's fee i'm getting some of it back finally and um so i thought well how hard can it be which is always (laughs) every time i say that something goes horribly wrong (laughs) so how hard can it be so i turned up at the studio loco studios in us great studio um, SSL E series, just I love that. I used to love that place, and um, so I thought, well, I'll get there, and the house engineer is going to be there. He'll know what's going on. It'll be fine. I got there, and it's like, um, oh, hi, hey, um, I am I'm Greg. Oh, oh, hi, I'm Loz. Um, right, Loz. Okay. Um, obviously, like, just between you and me, I've never used an SSL before. You know, you're gonna have to help me through the day. He goes, oh, it's my first day as well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right, Lars. This is what we're going to do, right? The band aren't here yet. Jeff, we're just going to bluff it out. If we just hit enough buttons, we'll get enough level to tape, we'll be fine. It was all done 24 track tape. If we just keep hitting them buttons, we'll be fine. I, I don't know what mode we had the desk in. We were, it was just like, we were just kind of like, I have a cup of tea, boys. You know, I have a break for fun. We're just frantically pressing buttons, trying to make things work. And, and we got through the day, and the band were none the wiser to this day until this moment. <laughs> That's one thing that I, that I really admire and notice about you working well, with I've you. I've my way through. No, well, now that you've mentioned it, now that you say it, I'm, I'm going to be thinking that every time if I ever work with you again. But when we were doing the op shop records, the, the one thing that um, 
was great about having you work on them was that you were never pushing us we knew that there, that time was against us and it's costing us money to be in the studio and you know take after take after take but never ever did you go for fuck's sake you've got to get this done otherwise yeah. you know you're going to screw the whole record up so you know managing time was one of your and keeping yeah. calm in the face of yeah. um well my, you know my theory always was that any stomach ulcers i get are mine and i've earned them Right. But there's no need to pass on my any problems to you as musicians, yeah. Uh-huh. Because you know the worst thing you can say to a musician is hurry up, which has taken ages. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, you need to put everyone in that mindset, and and you know, you know, I plan out every single day in the studio. I mean, I know I might sound a complete chancer and bluffer, but that was though that was just a, a way to get to where I needed to be. You know, mm. it's like if I hadn't said yes to the BBC, I wouldn't have ended up recording loads of really great bands on BBC sessions mm. and I wouldn't have had lots of other work in comparison. You know, mm-hmm. If I'd not said yes to, to the studio manager at, um, at Soundspace, I wouldn't have ended up buying the studio and ended up, you know, we bought a little studio off off the studio manager. And, this is in LA? No, this is in, in, in Cardiff. Oh, right. We bought this little tiny studio where the, where I'd got that job when I needed the divorce money. Uh-huh. We ended up buying the studio. This is, there's another little interesting story in that, in that. The studio manager came to us and said, I've got to sell the studio because I'm behind in the rent and, you know, I've got... I'm, he basically ended up going bankrupt, essentially. So, and there was another young kid working at the studio, um, Kerry Collier, and, uh, and, the, and, and so the studio... Off, studio manager offered me the studio including the lease for eight thousand pounds and it's like god that's a pretty good deal and i said i said to kerry you know pete's offered me the studio for like eight thousand pounds i said it'd be amazing to get because we could you know you, you you could turn this place into a little sort of you know with a good bit of expertise and fresh coat of paint and a new coffee machine you can make this place you know we could be a little money money pit you know a money trap sort of thing yeah and um I said, oh, I said, you know, if only, if only I could raise some money. He goes, he said, oh, I, you know, I got half the money, and I'm like, but you're on the dole. He said, yeah, but I just saved it. I thought, How now the that's is- the man I want to be in business with. <laughs> yeah, right. He'd saved like four thousand quid, you know, uh, and Walled and on the dole. Yeah, and it was like, that's amazing, you know. And so it basically, I said, right, I'll go and raise the other four grand. So I, I went to the my bank, the NatWest Bank, on the Monday. And I said, I actually went on the Friday and I said, can you lend me £4,000 till Monday so I can buy a recording studio? So I'll give, <laughs> you, give it you back on Monday. <laughs> I said, Where are you going to get the money by Monday? Well, I, I mean, I had to go and borrow it from the bank. Do, it? Yeah, but then you're going to have to pay them back by the Monday. How it, well, yeah, but th- I wasn't thinking about that. The time. Right, okay. <laughs> I was just right. thinking, how can, so I again, get, how, can I get, to the, how can I get the money? Right. And I'm like, I will... And the, and the, to be fair to the bank, I said, "Look, it's a really good business opportunity. You know, we we've you know we we did a, we did a bit of research in, in what the catchment area was and sort of how much money we could earn just just on the book <laughs> because once we knew the producer was for sale because we controlled the bookings, yeah, we just we basically just shunted all the bookings until after the date we knew we were going to take over. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's, it was a little bit cruel, but you know, we we agreed to buy the studio. It was yeah. like you know, we here was the date. It's like." Oh, that's a good learner there. Look, um, we're a little bit busy for the next couple of weeks. Can you come in start in November or whenever it was? <laughs> so we knew what we knew what our potential. So anyway, the, the bank said yes. There was no way I could pay them back on the Monday. Right, it was okay. never going to happen. And yeah. in the end, it got a bit ugly. And you know, eventually they did get paid back. But it was like if I hadn't have done that, you know, the second client or third client in was the Manic Street Preachers. Right. You know, and it was like I, all I was doing was making tea on on the Everything Must Go record. Um, they were finishing the record there. Because Kerry knew James, they were quite good friends. I think they'd been in school together or something. Uh-huh. So they came in and um, and then they then they came back and to work on This Is My Truth album. And and James was like, um, we haven't got an engineer today. Do you want to start, do you want to do some engineering for us? So, so I ended up like engineering a lot of demos and then then that worked really well. And it was like, I ended up recording a load of, um, you saw the Sun from my heart, which is like a big, one of the big singles with them for that mm-hmm. record. And I ended up, that was a, you know, in the, in the three years that we owned the studio, we had two and 2.2 million record sales from a little 16 track studio in a back street in Cardiff. Wow. Yeah. So, so, so the studio that we bought for 8,000 pounds, cause we knew in a few, at some point it was going to be a compulsory purchased because we, um, 
because the whole area was being redeveloped. You know, the whole part of Cardiff was being knocked down and redeveloped, flattened and redeveloped. Mm-hmm. And somebody eventually turned up on our door and said, "Oh, we didn't realize you were here. You know, well, we need to we need to buy the studio off you." Here's a check. Yeah. And so you know, here's a check for forty thousand quid. I mean, okay, oh, forty grand, it'd be great. And then and then we we so we went to see it, so you know, get some legal advice. And they're, they're saying, then they said, "This your studio is worth way more than that." look at how many record sales you've got the value of the business is way more than they're offering you so we went into like three or four years of litigation over it and eventually got 175,000 pounds wow and we set up we set up a record label or yeah. we you know the money's all gone now so no one come after me for money <laughs> but it's you know we set up a label we you know we had to probably put deposits on houses and and, and we sort of like you know we, we earned that money because that was the value of the business yeah mm. we didn't even realize ourselves you know because and, and that first year we had two albums nominated for brit awards this is my truth the manix which won it um mm-hmm. um international velvet the catatonia record we did some of that and that was my first real really big break as a as an engineer sort of so I had, you know, I, I all of a sudden I got these amazing engineering credits for hit yeah. records, and it was like, oh, I should get a manager. So I eventually, you know, I, I started hitting up the management companies, and then in the meantime, I, the manager had asked if I do a production work on Know Your Enemy, which is the next record. Uh-huh. So I ended up producing a couple of songs on that. So, you know, I owe them a lot because they they like took faith in the they you know they said. They realised that I, you know, I knew what, what I was doing vaguely, despite all the stories I've told you. I seem to be able to sort of like, you know, get a good result with them. Well, yeah. the, I've always looked at or thought of producing as a bit of a dark art. You know, you really, you, uh, a good producer can get amazing things out of a band or an artist um, that you know they work with a different another producer that can't get that kind of thing out of them. So with the with the Manic Street Preachers, there's definitely that. Um, you've given them something as well as what they've. Yeah, you know, I know. I, mean, I know. We ended up, ended up being a ten, eleven year relationship. You know, yeah. sort of we we worked on lots of records together. We but did, you worked on Nicky's up solo. I did. Too? I did the whole of Nick's album. I did a yeah. lot of James's. I played dr- drums on James's record, which right. actually was probably the most fun I've ever had in a studio. It was yeah. just kind of me and him, and we would just sit there. In the time we weren't playing Led Zeppelin riffs, we'd be <laughs> playing songs for his record, and. Uh-huh. Um, it was, and he really, it's one of those musicians that by hook or by crook gr- drags the best out of you, whether uh-huh. it's as a producer or as a musician. And a lot of that's quite intimidating because he's like, he's so focused on, on how you make records. And I probably learned more from him than any other person I've ever worked with because he, he would, he taught me the whole idea of sonic images on records. Like you, he would come in with an armful of albums and say, let's listen to all these records. And we listen to all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, well, I'm just going to, it's a bit like this and a bit like this. And I, but I want the, the vibe to be like, you know, a smoky club in the 1920s, you know. And, and he plays all these pictures in your head, which makes making records really easily when you've got a really clear vision of what the artist wants from it. Yeah, right. And, and he taught me all about that. And, and then doing his solo record, it was like sort of, you know, how you could do, you know, if you, if you just had bass and drum, um, guitar and drums together, how much you can sort of bend things and make things kind of like, you know, when there's not the restriction of a third musician, mm-hmm. how how that can work and how you can make just two things sound really great. And, yeah. and, and dynamics, the, you know, there would be tracks where you'd like, I want you to play as, as quiet as you physically can play, which I'd never done before. You know? right. and I, I learned all these amazing things working with him and it's like, and um, yeah, so rather than just the career thing that it gave me, yeah, it was and it, it was the musical education, but also, you know, I dropped out of school to sort of play in bands. You know? mm. I I, le- I had more of an education about art and about politics and about you know a lot of my interest in politics I have now comes from working with them because right. they would just sit there and they they would be, you'd have these long discussions about you know like James Cameron. You know, I read you know, so-and-so's biography today. And it was like, you know, and then, and then we'd have this, these huge long discussions. So half the records were just discussing things that weren't involved with the record. Right. So I just sat there and just got an education from listening to, you know, Nick had a politics degree. Yeah. You know, I talked to drum, to Sean about drums because he just, you know, he loves drums. Yeah. Drums and guns and fast cars. He's, <laughs> you know, he if, if, you, if you kind of, if you had to draw a drummer, an archetypal drummer, he would yeah. be, you know, fast cars, guns, drums yeah. No. You know? yeah. and he knows a lot about all those things you know? yeah 
and um so part of, part of um we want to talk about how you got to come over to New Zealand for the first time and how you were involved in that but before we do that and I'm sort of jumping ahead because you you work in part of in tandem with um uh, with Clint Murphy yeah. quite often yeah and he, I've just been with Clint actually for a couple of weeks yeah. right yeah and the two as a team you guys are you know tw- twice the power sort of like the power rangers coming together it's uh, a power dynamic that I've never seen before or since that I think does infuse the album and the bands you're working with um and also you know it makes it a shitload easier when you've got people of that ilk working with you it's the it's it's the thing I found that as you get more experienced is the the realization that delegation is a strength, not a weakness. Mm. I mean, you start off as a young producer and engineer, and you want to do everything. You know, when mm-hmm. I first came to New Zealand, like there wasn't, wasn't a record I, that I that I was producing that I hadn't didn't mix myself because mm-hmm. I thought, well, I, only I will have the, the idea in my head of what the record should be. Mm-hmm. And when I when I turned up at York Street for the first day, and you know, there was like a Neve desk, which I, I was an SSL man; I'd never used Neves before. So I had to rely on Clint to kind of like, you know, help me through the process. So you didn't uh, bluff this one? You actually... No, right. It's like, well, you know, it's like, you know, I have to rely on him to do something. And then very early on the first day, it was like, this kid really does know what he's doing. You know, he's really, really good at his job. Right. Yep. You know, a lot of that comes from the training that Jeremy gave him and the, and the, and the ethos at the studio, which is very much an old school studio Sort of, you know, you start off as mate. You start off making tea or coffee, and then you mm-hmm. work your way through, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, and and he was great. And it was like, and I remember going back and putting the tracks on, in um, in studio in Wales. And it was like, these sound are fantastic, you know. Uh, you know, he'd we, um, mixing. We, we kind of I, with the mixing, it was like, you know, he would set something up, and then I'd go and I tweak a couple of things. It was it was kind of a bit of a sort of joint process. But mm-hmm. but really, I was like, you know, this this is great. So when I got asked to come back and do. Um, playground battle for the feelers because when I was here um, doing the, those first couple of tracks and doing some seminars I went to see James Southgate at Warner. yeah you were brought out for a seminar very similar yeah, to the uh, song res- thing re- the re- Resonate which was right. um, I think John Peel had done it the year before and there was about five or six of us my manager Steve came over right. Steve, I was on tour with the Manistry Preachers playing percussion for a, I did a couple of years with them right which was great going back on the road in my 40s, you know, playing percussion at Wembley and Pyramid Stage at Glastonbury and, yeah, you know, oh all this hell. stuff. <laughs> you know, I thought I'd given up on touring after the Corey Hart tours and everything and then playing Japan and going back there and doing everything. And I was on the tour bus, on the managed tour bus. We were, I think we were going to, we were on our way to Brighton to play and uh, Stephen, up, mate, 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 as he, as he was wanting to do, mate, do you, want, do you want to go to New Zealand in January? I'm like, well, yes, good. I mean, that's that's where I learned. You always say yes when people say, "Do you want to go to New Zealand?" <laughs> it's like because I said yes, you know, without even thinking about it, because I'd never even been south of the equator before. You know? so right. Where it was, you didn't think it was part of Australia. No, I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd have, you know, I knew because you know I'm Welsh. I, mean, I knew about the rugby, oh, of you course, know, and, yeah. and the endless pain we have to suffer every that will end in a few weeks' time when oh, Wales come here. <laughs> <No. laughs> um, anyway, yeah, I, I knew about the endless pain. And I knew about um, split ends. Because my I was in a band with a, a mate of mine who was um, uh, I was a big Split Ends fan, and um, yeah, so I knew a few things about New Zealand. I knew it was a long way away, <laughs> yeah. But that was pretty much it, you know. And I yeah. came over to do that. And um, but while I was here doing Resonate, uh, as I've been, I've always something I've really worked on for the last like twenty years is the idea of micro careers. It's like you can't always be successful in Britain or America, and there's lots of other countries, you know, like with the whole Chinaski thing in the Czech Republic. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like they, they, these are good little small careers you can have, and I and and so when I would go into a new country, it'd be like let's go and see some studios, let's go and see some record labels, let's go and see some managers, let's try and build up a relationship, you know, and try and secure one or two months' work in that territory every year. Because then you do that in four or five different places. Yep. So at that point, I had like New Zealand, um, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Ireland, Greece. Greece is a little bit later, but um, lots of other countries that would all provide me with a bit of work every year. So I'd just be flying around doing all these things and 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 securing quite a bit of work. But I came over and did and did you know and I went to see James Southgate, who was, who was CEO at Warner's at the time. And he, and he gave me a feelers record, the second album, and said, we've done a new album for this band, do you want to come and do it? And um, and I remember meeting James Reed at um, 
Heathrow Airport, he was here with Donald on a holiday, and it was possibly the worst meeting I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> it was like, firstly, I forgot to take the, the CD with me. I couldn't remember any of the song titles. So James made me go back to the car and get the CD. Like. And I, I just thought, and I just came away thinking, that was the worst pitch I've ever done in my entire life. Because I'd been really hot on the out. You know, I, I spent a lot of time on pitches, you know. It's oh, yeah. like, this, I've got a lot of records for pitching people. And um, yeah, but but... I guess it was no one else in there for the gig, so yeah, so I got it and we did the record and it did it, it did great. And so obviously on the back of that, uh, but I remember towards the end of that record, um, being downstairs on the internet because it was that one computer at York Street at the time that was you know that the got, office. I could get, yeah the, down, the downstairs office thing yeah and I heard some music upstairs and I'm like that band sound good and and it was it was the, some tracks from the first Op Shop record. I think they were compiling the record upstairs oh, or something. Oh, right. Yeah. And I'm like, so I started lobbying pretty hard, like Tracy McGann and and, and Jeremy and Adrian. Uh-huh. And it was like, I think I would do a really good job with that band. I mm. think you should let me do the next record. So I just got, I, you know, that, you know, I, I just kept banging away for a couple of years until we eventually did that. So. And, and then you came to see us play with Athlete, didn't you? I did. At the... I, I did. Yep. Was that, that the second album? Shocking gig. Second, oh, yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because Brady did the first record, and then, and I th- and um, I just thought it would be a really good fit. Brady Blade. Brady Blade. Yeah. Brady Blade did the first. Did yeah. the first. Record. The first album. Yeah. And no way. Then uh, yeah, and then yeah. Greg did the next. Two. I know that guy. I want to actually ask him to be a guest. Yeah. Oh yeah. Give him a call. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's he'll talk. He'll lovely. talk forever. He's a great bloke. Lovely. Yeah. 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 And he's got lots of great stories as well. Yeah. Yeah. But um. But yeah. So I just we just did that, and it was like, it was a really difficult record to make. Yeah, I think me. You know, yeah, it me, was. I yeah. think me and Bob was got on. Cause dr- there's yeah. always a drummers' union. Yeah, that you, yeah. And often you we can speak the, the same language. Yeah, the thing, you get a know? drummer on on yeah. board, and and you can you, know, you can sort of like you, you've got an ally in the band. And I've always thought making records with a band's like joining the gang, right? And, <laughs> and sometimes you're a bit outside of the gang. And I, you know, I, I very much felt an outsider on that record. Mm. You know, and I and I think you know, luckily me and Bob got on well. I got on well with Clint as well. Clint You'd worked with him before, hadn't you? With I'd Carly, worked with, I'd worked with Clint on the on Carly's on Carly binding record. Yeah. So, so I felt I had a few allies in there, mm-hmm. but you know, me and Jason just butted heads all the way through the record. That's it, right? And, and it's mm-hmm. like, but often those are the people you end up with really strong, lasting relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, me and Jason get on like a house on fire. And you've done a you solo know? stuff recently. I just solo yeah. stuff with him, and it's like, but yeah, I mean, because by a bizarre set of coincidences, that record was that making that record was being filmed. Adam Adam Jones is filming That's it. That's right. Yeah, uh, which ended that. up as a TV show because right, yeah. no one wanted to know when it was before you were first making it because it was. But by the time it, you know it, the, the record had become a massive record. Yeah, like you know there was a TV show there that right from first rehearsals, yeah. right through you know, and <laughs> luckily yeah, for me, reality show. There's lots of there's, lo- <laughs> there's lots of shots of me banging onto the band about what a great song One Day is and how they should really put it on oh. the record and it was like it's a shit song yeah, it's rubbish it's like, it's like an Eagles B-side it's all this stuff and I'm like no honestly it's we really kept, really we good be- yeah we all of us butt heads against that about that one and maybe actually yeah. me I didn't I didn't want maybe oh no me. F- yeah, yeah. And, and, and there was there's a great there's a great there's a great there's a great shot in there of like of, right I'm sitting there I'm going right we're going to have a go at this One Day song but if any of you make it sound like Brian Adams, I'll kill every last motherfucking one of you. That's right? completely understandable. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 the, and they start, and the next shot is me hitting the button. It sounds like fucking Brian Adams. <laughs> and it was, it was, um, it was the and, white and, and then, I, then I'm going, in and, and you can hear it like slightly off mic, me going to Jason. Jason, oh, it's shit, it's shit. I'm not, it's your best song. It's honestly, it's, you know. And they're, you know, cued lots of shots of like Silver Scroll Awards and like, you know, and, and like, you know, sort of like total vindication. It's like, but, you know, for every one of those decisions you make that's right, you make a thousand that are wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just happened the one time I made a right decision, there was a film crew there filming it. Yeah, yeah. That's right. But, you know, but, but the, the record we made after that was one of the most joyous experiences I've ever had. We had a yeah. brilliant time recording it, and it was like... My, definitely my favourite of all of our records was yeah, that Yeah, you know, I one. love that. And I'm some of the work I'm most proud of. So mm. the fact that, that you're a drummer, does that affect your role as producer with the band? Are you more critical of drummer, or do you kind of... I, 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 do you take I the really, drummer head yeah, off? I spend a lot of time working with drummers. With the drummer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really yeah. push drummers hard, because it's such an essential part of the record. Mm. And a lot of producers of my generation are drummers. Right. 
because you either mm. embrace the idea of being a traditional drummer who played kit, yep. or you are oh, yeah, drum machines and programming is actually pretty good. Right. So you, a lot of us went down that avenue where we still played kit, but we also embraced programming. Yeah. And a lot of those guys, you know, like guys like Richard Burgess and Chris Hughes, we did the Fears records. They, we're all drummers, you know. We sort mm. of like we. You know, I also think, I mean, because Clint Murphy is also an extraordinary a, drummer. It's one of the reasons and, oh, we get, we get, and you know. yeah, and and I think um, for me, for my mind, I've I've thought about it over the years. I've, I would never be able to be a producer. I wouldn't have the um, patience for it. But <laughs> um, but I've thought about you know you and Clint and and Clint Murphy and the way that um, you approach things. And I I swear it's got something to do with um, just as a drummer, you know how to listen. To right. the rest of the band, and you can make those kind of not not I'm not saying that the other bands, uh, the other members of the band get all kind of you know yeah. siloed in their own thinking. It's just that you're constantly listening out for other things yeah. and controlling the dynamic. Well, everything yeah. keys off yeah. the drums. Everything you know. Yeah. You know, luckily when I did when I did Second Hand Planet, I just come off working on on James Bradfield solo record and Nick's solo record, and um, I think I was just starting to do some work on Send Away the Tigers and the next Manix record. And I, and I felt in a really good place mentally that I, I, I felt that my productions had come on a lot in the previous couple of years from doing those records. Because um, I'd, I'd, I'd given up production for, for about a year um, just before then because I... Actually, it was six months, really. Um, I, I, I did Lifeblood with the Manics. which was a particularly hard record to do. I went straight from that into doing um, Beautiful Intentions with Melanie C., Mm-hmm. Yep. Both really high pressure records from label and management wise. What was she like to work with? She's a, a total sweetheart. Yep. She was like one of the nicest people I've ever worked with. She's really thoughtful, really, really good fun. Yeah, um, cool. Super professional. But the, those rec sort of records, there's a huge amount of pressure on the producer. Mm. And it was the first record she'd ever made with one producer. All her yeah. records were multiple producers. All oh, right. You know, and and also you look at the pre, you know, you pick up the previous record, be like two tracks with Rick Rubin, you know. Yeah. It's like, you know, so it's just that the whole record is full of like world name producers, you know, and I still have that mentality. I'm some guy from Cardiff, you know, right. who somehow ended up <laughs> doing this, you know, because that, that record was kind of, I, I was, this is going to sound a bit, a bit wanky, but I was in the swimming pool at Grouse Lodge Studios working on Lifeblood. And my only, my only solace every night was to go for a swim because it was such a high pressure record. Mm. And it was, and I was in the pool and, and I got a message, you got to call your management. So I, I, phoned, I got up, phoned them back and um, they were like, um, we want you to pitch for this Mal C record. I'm like, well, I'm totally the wrong guy for that. You know, I'm not a pop guy. Oh, but she's got a band now and she wants it to be like a band record, you know? And she's been doing these little tours around the UK to get the band in shape for the record they yeah. want someone who can deal with that dynamic mm. and um, so basically I thought well if I'm going to if I'm going to pitch for it I'm going to pitch the shit out of it so I I spent weeks listening to all the demos and every solo record all the Spice Girls records you know I could I could I'm a, an aficionado of all those <laughs> records and it was like and I, and, and I did notes for all the demos and, and, and I sort of um and I went in, and there was—I remember there was—it was like a, there was seventeen producers pitching for the record. And I, I'm like, well, I'm going to hope in hell of getting it, but I'm going to do the best pitch. So when when their manager, her manager phones up my manager and says, oh, "Greg didn't get the job, but he did a really good pitch," you know, yeah. I thought, well, that, that, that's the best I can hope for. Mm. And but it backfired, and the call went from the manager, "Oh, we'd like you to do some songs for the record." <laughs> uh, I'm like, oh my god, I actually got you know, because I remember the first time she phoned. Because you know, I remember in the '90s, someone said to me, "You know, it was you know, who's your favorite Spice Girl?" And you know, if someone asked you to do a Spice Girls record, would you say yes? You know, like you know, you try to be a bit cool, like oh, well, you might do it for the money, you know. So like, yeah, but I wouldn't really be into it. <laughs> but when you get the chance to actually do it, it's like shit. You know, it's Sporty Spice because you phone up and I'd like keep the phone messages and playing to my mates. Right? Look, it's Sporty Spice on the phone. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and it was so. Like, I'm glad you said that because I was trying to figure out which one she was. You're a sporty. <laughs> and, 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 you know, just by sheer coincidence, like um, Clint Murphy phoned me up and said, I've just moved to the UK. Have you got any work for me? I said, you can come and do this, do the Mal C record with me next week. 
<laughs> and he was shit. like, so the timing was uh, perfect. And uh, I, I think he used the money to pay off a student loan. And you know, it's yeah. like, and we were we were in Metropolis, we were in Livingston, we were in yeah, five or six different studios all over the place doing this stuff. And it was this mammoth yeah, thing. Beautiful. But it was a really high pressure record. And 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 to go back to what I was originally saying, it was like before I did your record, I'd taken a bit of time away from producing uh-huh. just because those records had afforded me time off. Right. So I rented a camper van, drove around the South Island, saw some amazing things and just, hey, go back to nature, man. You know, <laughs> watch some whales, watch some dolphins and, you know. But back, to, it, this, back to the drummer thing. Have you? I, I'm guessing you've had to work with bands where the drummer hasn't been very good. Has that happened? Yes. And so, there have been legion and, of and bands. What, band what does drummers. a professional like yourself do about that? You, you figure out a Replace them after when they go home at night time. <laughs> yeah, everyone thinks I... I, I, I the um, I will admit in uh, in three occasions we do what was called the dreaded jump on, which is basically the drum is so truly atrocious there yeah. is no way to actually make him sound any good. It's usually not timing is actually not too bad. You can work around it. You know, mm. there'd be some really interesting drums you've done on records where you see, okay, let's do some kick drums, right? We're going to do high for verse two. You know, we literally break into the little sections. Right. And we just kind of work our way through it until we construct something that's pretty cool. Because often the part will be really interesting. It's just the they have the inability to play it. Yeah. So we just figure out ways where we can actually get them to play it. And they're like, oh, I sound great. Yes, right. you sound great. <laughs> Admittedly, there's a lot of Pro Tools involved, but it sound really good. <laughs> Um, but sometimes, if someone can't hit a drum properly, like one shot's a rim shot, next shot's a thing, it's like, and they don't make the, you know, you know, like, like with, if you go get a great guitarist, you could pick up some piece of crap guitar. I've done a white point in that guitar. <laughs> you could pick up a piece of crap, any piece of crap that, guitar. But that one happens to be a piece of crap. And fine. make it sound incredible. <laughs> right. And like, you know, like a great drummer can make a, like a really lousy, crappy old drum kit sound good. Mm. But, but, you know, conversely, a really great drum kick can sound terrible if played by a bad drummer yeah, yeah. so there's, there, there was one particular occasion where I, 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 I'll try to be really sort of you know not give any clues but <laughs> I basically said to the assistant um, after like a day of trying to get these drums right can you here's 20 quid take the band to the pub if, you, if they decide to come back call and give me this code word <laughs> so like so so he ships off down the pub with a band and um i'm like so, you know it's me it's me and clint murphy i'm like right murph okay we got about two hours we got to replace all these drums but i've got to play the same parts as in so what i done i got the drummer to play the parts as best he could so i knew what the parts were mm. so i basically had to sort of like ended up being ended up being about 45 minutes by the time they were coming back but in that 45 minutes, we'd replaced all the drums for that day. And it's like, you know, uh, uh, and, um, and like the, so, well, okay, okay, there's a bit of editing to do, a bit of sorting out. So you guys, you know, you go off to bed and we'll sort of like, so the next morning we played in the tracks. Oh man, those drums sound great. And, and, he, and he thought it was him. <laughs> well, they still doesn't know to this day. <laughs> I mean, obviously we're talking about Bobby, but clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was, those were tough. And the the, thing, the yeah. thing about working with someone like Clint, Clint Murphy, you know, he used to be called um, Bigger Beats Murphy because right. he could make those, you know, he would doctor those things to make them sound massive. Oh, he's, you know, well, I should probably tell you about Bobby Foot, shouldn't I, really? <laughs> but, I've heard the term. The term Bobby yeah. Foot. This actually yeah. become a legendary term that's oh, been remember, used by a thousand people. Yeah. Really? We actually developed a recording technique because Bob's got, amazing drummer though Bob is, he's yeah. got this slight technique thing where you tap you play the bass drum and you tap in between the beats <laughs> yeah with the kick drum. Excuse me in time. So you, get, you get this do, do, you know little sort of you know sort of higher waffle kind of thing like, going on like kick ghosting yeah a little bit of ghosting yeah so it's like the last thing you want to do with a drummer is try and change their technique because then it, it throws off their whole yeah. thing so it's like you bob do you do what you do because it sounds amazing so but what we did we started this thing to to, to deal with the bobby foot issue was basically <laughs> sample Bob's kick drum at lots of different velocity levels right. and then just replace the notes so you just be basically getting rid of the ghost notes so all the kick drums are sample replaced but with the, with the same dynamics that Bob's using right and it, it's like wow this is great it means the low end's really consistent so mm. your bass guitar and your bass drum work great so by accident we found this really great technique which, which we've used for a thousand bands since <laughs> no shit you know but hey, hey, you're welcome world. man yes yeah, yeah. so, well, thank <laughs> you Bob and, and, and well, well, when we first you know, we first, you know, I always like to get bands in the studio all playing together at the start, and we would, we would sit down, and every so often they'd be like, 
bit, a bit of bobby foot, a bit of bobby foot. <laughs> so it's become this kind of phrase that we kind of, you know. That... And how, do you, how have you heard of this? I know this is the first time I've ever heard of it. I think you told uh, me about yeah. it. Did I? Oh, okay, then yeah. maybe. So, so, so yeah, bobby foot is, um, is, is you know, it's, it's a thing, huh? but it's, it's, it's certainly you know, easy to sort out because, you know, I, there's nothing worse than trying to change a drum. Just put a gate on it. It'll just, it'll just throw them up. But, you know, it's not an imperfection, Bob. It's just, you know, it's, it's a, a beautiful part of your thank you of, yeah. of your it's thing. A, it's you know? a foible. It's uh, a foible. I like to look at it oh, you know, believe me, I have a million bad technique things. You know, it's yeah. like yeah. Hang on, you just said it wasn't a bad technique. Thing. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> digging, digging, digging. <laughs> but yeah, so so you know, you, you just find a million workarounds for different things, and, yeah. and and it's the same with every instrument. But and then there's also the musicians themselves. And I've always thought that a, a good producer it was almost um, a psychologist. Um, you're all those things. You're a psychologist. Yeah. And bloody, um, you know. Psychology is fifty percent of making a record. Right. If you don't have, if you have musicians who aren't motivated, who are in the wrong headspace, you're not going to get a good performance out of them. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to find. You know, sometimes that's taking them aside and giving them shit because right. they're just being an ass, mm. or it's just like that gentle kind of like you know, off, there's usually one or two band members who are a bit beaten down. I, 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 it wasn't the case with Art Shop, but. You know, often there's like there's some. We didn't let it show. But yeah, you didn't let it show. Yeah, you just in, you get internalized it. <laughs> you know, someone who's that really quiet. There's a great. Have you have you heard of Applique Strategies? The Brian Eno. Oh yeah. It's Brian a set Eno, of cards yeah. essentially that Brian Eno oh, yes. developed. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can actually get it as a phone app now. And Applique Strategies is basically a set of cards that Brian Eno developed. And what you do, you if you were stuck on a recording session, you would take a card out and do what it says on the card. Oh, right. Now, if you got, if you were brand new with Coldplay budgets, that's fine because some of them will say erase and start again. <laughs> so you so you try to ignore those ones. And but but there are some cards in that are, that are really cool. And when I, apart from the, the my favorite, which is honor thy error as a hidden intention. Yeah. Um. One this listen. One is listen to the quiet voice. Now, often there's a there's a musician in the room who doesn't say much, who probably has a, a mine of brilliant ideas, yeah. but he's so been beaten down by the big personalities in the band that they don't, you know. So you, you kind of want to hone in on them and maybe take them aside, like, right? You know, just you know, get, get, have a relationship with them, so you know, so you can discuss things with them, mm. maybe outside of the of the of, of the rest of the musicians, yeah. And often they'll come up with something really good. Mark from Catatonia was. Kind of like that. Although he was quite a confident person, he would never say anything until he would say one thing, and it would be the most brilliant idea you'd right. heard all day. Because <laughs> he just had that ability. He was just such a great musician and songwriter. Yeah, he didn't need to say much. He just let us all get on with shouting at each other and hacking away at the songs. And he'd say, well, "Why don't you just do that?" And probably refined his thought as well. There through it the is. Process. You know, yeah. there's the yeah. idea. And yeah. it was like, so you want to encourage those, those you know, that do you want to try to change the dynamic? Because as a producer, you're going to go in and provide a different dynamic anyway yeah um so that instantly changes things so you've got to try and make that work for yourself so mm. so it's like it often starts with it it often it often starts with the drummers union thing where you just like well just be fair the drummer because he's the first person i'm going to deal with you know right and work with so let's try and you know yeah and, but then that's pretty easy because yeah. you, know, you make the drum sound good and it's like oh yeah. yeah, and and the psychological part of also getting the right kind of performance out of people, right? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's like you know, being a director in a movie. Uh, you know, particularly you, you, you've got to you've got to put them in the right headspace, and yeah. not every day is going to be a good vocal day. Right, you can get through yeah. most other things, but vocals, if the vocals isn't in the right headspace, it ain't going to happen. Yeah, so mm -hmm. you need to build time into the session for things to fail, and that's that's a big problem with now the budgets nowadays and how fast you've got to make records. Mm. You know, because it's like. Yes, you can stay at home and you can just, you can spend hours, you know, sort of just working on things, you know, and sort of like. But then, then you get that thing that's like you don't really know when to stop working on things. Yeah. So you know, if you if you set, I think every record should have, should have a finite amount of time to spend on it. I agree. Yeah. You know, and and you need to set yourself as those sort of you know I do I do it on a daily basis. Like, this is what I want to achieve each day, and. Um, so I just kind of like I kind of work my way through, and and, and one of the things that I, that I remember you used to do, if if say one of us wasn't having a good day, I mean, and I had a few of those on that last record, I remember one session where you just said, "Look, this is just not happening for you tonight. Go home." I don't think you replaced the drums uh, <laughs> the next day, but uh, but you would do other things like comping or editing. You know, we'll we'll yeah. just we'll edit for the rest of the night. Once you get past the first two or three days, there's always extra jobs that need doing. Yeah, mm. I mean, a lot of that on your records, we used to do a lot of those jobs in the studio. Now, because of technology, a lot of those jobs are what I 
well, it used to be called the shit jobs list. Is now we call I now call offline work because it sounds a bit better than shit jobs list, <laughs> which is essentially things like um, any drum editing you want to do, sample replacement, yeah. backing vocal comping. Think you don't need to be burning expensive studio time to do that. Someone mm-hmm. can do that on a laptop, and because of my relationship with New Zealand and when I'm here with the UK, that we tend to do that as overnight work. So at the end right. of each day, we'll upload. With a with a list of what he's doing, right. yeah. and then like an engineer here who we who we work with, or Clint, or one of the guys I work with in the UK, Nick Portman, or yeah, Nick Portman. But you know, often yeah. do our Europe when we're in Europe, we'll often do our work, our, our offline work here. Right. So you get in the morning, all the drums are done, all the vocal backing vocals are sorted. You know, yeah. and it's, it's it works great because mm. you're basically you know you, you're running your sessions twenty four hours a day. So a lot of the things we used to burn studio time on, mm-hmm. just, you, you're almost having the time you spend on a record. Right. And, and and you know you've got just got to be on top of the technology to be able to you know to do do all that. People get amazed when they see us doing it. Yeah, they're like, I'm like, well, it seems so obvious to me. Call centers do it. Yeah. So why yeah. can't we do it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The problem yeah. is you you end up going to Rockfield and you find that the internet's running at some so stupidly slow <laughs> speed. <laughs> so it's like, right, who don't you need? Right, who's in the brass section? So so <laughs> pro, 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 pro Peter, <laughs> who's the or Peter, Peter, who's the is the is the the trumpet player for Chernaski, um, we would send him into Weather Spoons every day with a laptop, <laughs> you know, because he wasn't needed for a while. And the poor guy, you know, he's 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 giving, he's he's teetotal now. He's giving up drinking, so we send him into a pub <laughs> all day with a laptop. So you have to sit there and not drink all day whilst uploading everything. You know, it's like so he, we still call him Upload. His name is now Upload. So Upload Man. And, um, There'll be times when you'd. Um, I was just thinking about you were talking about the psychology thing before and and sort of dealing with those issues and bands and egos and what have you, of which bands tend to have a few really really strong um, egos. And there was one time that you said to us that that really had to put us in line on that first record you did with us, Second Hand Planet, where there was a drinking session that happened one night and people just got too shit-faced and basically we burned up a whole evening of nothing happening. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and then you sat us down the next day and said, look, you you fuckers, we're going to have to stop that shit otherwise I'm walking or you know or, or, or yeah. I just can't work in that and then we, we all went oh okay shit yeah. this, this guy's actually in charge now. you know it, it is it, I love, there, was a, there was a great quote by, uh, on that film with where Jason was interviewed at, when he was, he was he was a DJ at Kiwi at the time I think and yeah. um, he said you know yeah recording's a hard process um, who's to say that we're right or wrong oh Greg does <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it was like yeah because it's somewhat you've got to put your foot down and yeah like I have a strict policy of not drinking or doing drugs or you know on a session because someone's got to be in charge but you've all everyone's got to kind of buy into that you know it, it is you have to be professional to a point and, and music there's plenty of time to drink and plenty of time to you know and, and there's nothing stop you 11 o'clock at night have, let's have a glass of wine you know that's fine mm-hmm. but if you if you if you're drinking from like lunchtime a few of those records. Um, <laughs> we were all but, he, but, I, but I remember, I remember, I remember going to to the first few of rehearsal and saying to Hamish and James, "Yeah, I got a strict no drinking policy when I'm working." And it was like again, it was one of those um, tumbleweed moments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so you know, we had to sort of, apart from what's now become le- the legendary Heineken Sunday where I allowed them to drink for one day on the session. Yeah. So Hamish actually set up a. Um, he bought in all these optics, and and where the rack is, we used to be at York Street. He set up like a bar with like you know had bottles of beer, and he had like optics <laughs> with like vodka, and so you know, and, and they bought crates of Heineken in, and we got nothing done all day essentially, you know. But it was yeah. kind of almost like a, it's like a, get, let's, let's let off some steam before we get back into it on Monday, and um, I can still remember some of the kind of like we were trying, we start off trying to do some guide tracks, and I remember the, the vocal variations that James did. Because it was so funny. To this day, when I hear that song, I just sing the alternate version. Um, and it's like uh, it was legendary, the old Heineken Sunday. But it was yeah, you have to do it at some point just to let them get it out of their system, and yeah. you know. But yeah, it's tough when, when people are you know it's one of those things I'll always remember. A quote from I think I'm pretty sure it was from you when we were doing that sessions. Those sessions was you know um, 
the song is never finished it's always it's abandoned you know at some point you've got to yeah you run out of money <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but you'll never make a perfect record you know the day you make a perfect record is the day you should give up because you're never going to do it again mm. yeah. and you're never going to do it you're always going to strive for it but you're never yeah. going to find that point where you make that perfect record what and, for you is the perfect record out there is there is there one that's close to perfect no, no, that you've no. not even close nothing yeah. even close there's records that I love and I you know I'm really I mean the, the two op shop records I'm really really proud of oh them. stop it I'm, no I'm really proud of them second album part because it did so well and we mm. you know we it was it was it was such a breakthrough record for you and it was, it's always mm. really pleasing to see and the, the following record because it was just a, a really in, a joyous process making it you know because mm. we had a, we had a bit of budget we had time we we did you know it was just fun to do mm. but you know there's records I've made that nobody's bought that you know only me and the band know how how great it was to do and how proud we are of it. Yeah, but that, you know, that music last is, op shop record. You no, know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no one no, you know, no knows. <laughs> yeah, I, I would put that in that category because you know, obviously, there's a different set of pressures once you've had a big record, you know. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I saw it with the Manix, I saw, I saw it with you. It's like, but you can all you, all you can do is what you do, and and you're ultimately creating something artistic. Now, if you can look back in twenty years and and go. Now I know nobody bought that record, but I'm really proud of everything we did on it. Mm. That's that should be an end in itself. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, you, you have no control over, you know, or very little control over, you know. Do you connect with the, the public? Do you people go out and mm. buy records? You know, yeah. You know, and, and having done records that have sold millions and records that have sold nothing, yeah. you know, you you still have to be as proud of the ones that sold nothing. Absolutely, right? you yeah. know, it's the ones that sold millions of records. And there are so many other things, other factors behind the scenes that A have to fall factors. into place for them to be. Yeah, and you just, yeah. and you just you, all you all you have to do is on the, on the last day of recording or the last day of mastering, you you can, you think right? I have done everything I can to make that the best it can possibly be. Now it's up to the record to do what it's going to do. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, so that's kind of you know that's that's the beauty and the curse of the job. It's it's nobody's right and nobody's wrong. It's music. It's not yeah. like building a wall. If it if it falls down, it, it's a it's a shit wall. If it stays <laughs> up, it's a good wall. Yeah, records aren't like that. They are a, you know they are a, they are a, a, an extension of the of the artist's creativity, and you know they do what they do. You know, and I've been lucky enough to do records that have been successful, and records that haven't. And I've done records that haven't that I'm equally as proud of. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky to have a 30-year career being a musician, you know, and not having to give up my day job. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's, so it's, so you know, the whole idea of this podcast was really interesting because how do you find a path through the music industry? Mm. And I think you, you're probably learning that it requires a lot of flexibility on everyone's behalf to be mm. able to do that, you know. And you you both are examples of that. It's like. Just you know, if you can stay, if you can make a living at being a musician or being creative, that's a success in its own right. And I think you've got to look at it that way. And just you know, what yep. will be, will be. You know. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 What a perfect place to stop. Just going to say that. Yeah. yeah. Feels like a good wrap up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Hey, well, wicked. Thank you so much, um, Greg. That has been enlightening. And well, I, I always knew it would be, and we're, we're lucky that you uh, were able to say yes and come along and do it tonight. Yeah, yeah. We've been chasing pleasure. you for weeks. Yeah, yeah my so. pleasure. But we really appreciate it. You know, I like, yeah. I like you know me. I like to talk. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, and if there if there's anything, if people wanted to get hold of you or follow what you're doing, maybe with song hubs, or do you have any online portals or anything like that? Yeah, just if you just put Greg Haver in. Yep. You'll find me pretty easily. Probably the only great favor. Instagram account. There's a few others. Yeah. Some there's some frat boy from you know. I don't think he's a frat. He was was it was it spring break and things. Uh-huh. It's not him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, it's, if you put Greg Haver producer, it'll it'll you'll find me really easily. And I, you know I'm I'm more than happy to speak to people about stuff and listen to tracks and you know yeah. Excellent. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Hey, thanks again, man. My pleasure.